Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. ...of the Word of God, and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. The book of Hebrews and chapter number 11. As we're going through this series of (laughs) Have Faith in God with the idea that Hebrews chapter 11 is what we call the Hall of Faith. And that over and over you could see the words by faith so and so, by faith so and so. And with it you could see that every time faith is used, action follows. That faith always produces action. And so we've already covered before by faith We saw the faith of Abel, he being dead, yet speaketh. Last time we saw by uh, faith Enoch, the faith of Enoch. And we could see that he walked with God and he was translated, that he was raptured out, that God brought him to to himself without Enoch dying. And we are looking forward to ourselves that we believe the same thing. That one day God is coming back for us and he's going to call us away. And that there are some who are not going to see death because of Jesus Christ coming. Now as we come to the book of Hebrews chapter number 11. Let's find the third person that God speaks about in this hall of faith chapter. And for a running start we're going to start at verse number 1. Which would include our two memory verses that we've been placing an emphasis on. Hebrews chapter 11 verse verse 1 and Hebrews 11 verse 6. But if you don't mind, let's just get a good running start and start at verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we may understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are, are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and it was found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God." But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he commanded or condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, mark that phrase that we find in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11, and notice with me in verse number 7, where it says, by faith Noah. By faith Noah. And if you don't mind, we're going to take some time this morning to look the faith of Noah. The faith of Noah. Now, Noah is an amazing character, an amazing historical figure in the Bible because he lived in a time of absolute wickedness. The Bible describes this time that that every imagination was continually wicked. That means people, if it came in their mind, they did it. They had no consequences. They did whatever they wanted. And it was so horrible that God looked down and he says, he repented of the idea that he made men, that man had broken his heart. Now, why did God make man in the first place? For fellowship. God created man to fellowship with him. However, when man lives the way he wants to, And does whatever he feels like it. Well then he has no fellowship with God. And so here is a creation that God made for the purpose of pleasing him. For the purpose of fellowshipping with him. And there was no one 
Out of all those people, at this time we calculate about one million people on this earth. One million people. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more, but nobody, nobody wanted to follow the Lord except for one man. And that man was Noah. Everyone else did whatever they wanted to. And it was through this man that God had spoken to him. It says in the book of Genesis, going over this account, that Noah found grace in God's sight. Here, we can see a little bit about Noah. Notice with me again in verse number 7, and we're going to break it apart. It says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by which he commanded the world and became heir of the righteousness which was by faith. Now, let me ask you a question. When did Noah become a believer? You guys think for me? When did Noah become a believer? When did he believe upon the Lord? Before the ark, right? Yes. And so he had trusted Christ as Savior, believed in the promises of God for the saving of his soul before he built the ark. And so did he build the ark to become saved spiritually? No. no. He built the ark because he was saved. He, because he believed in God. And now he wants to deliver his family, to save his family from the destruction that comes because of this. Once again, we could see faith is demonstrated by actions. The book of James goes through this in a lot more detail, that faith without works is dead. Now, it's not saying that you are saved by works, but your works are evidence that you're saved. For example... Someone could come to me and say, Preacher, I love Jesus. My next question is going to be, how's your Bible reading? Well, you know, well, then it doesn't match up. If you have faith, faith is always demonstrated by action. I love the Lord. Then how come you're not in church? Uh, you understand? Faith is always demonstrated by action. And so because he had faith, there was an action that was produced. Now, moment by moment, we're going to believe God and we're going to place our faith in him. This is exactly where we find Moses, or Noah that is found within the historical account of Genesis chapter number 6. As for now, let's stay here in Hebrews chapter number 11. And there are some things that I want you to see about Noah's life. As the Bible gives a commentary on Noah's life through the filter of the New Testament. Notice with me in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 7. The first thing I want to show you is Noah's faith. Noah's faith. Notice what it said. It said, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen yet. Now, this is an amazing thing when you put it in the light of history. Remember that God created the world in Genesis chapter number 1. And the Bible describes that at this time before the flood, it had never rained. So it had uh, watered the earth through a, a mist system in the beginning of creation. But at this time, it had never rained. And so God had a conversation with Noah. Now, I uh, cartoonize this, but we get the thing across. Noah, yes, sir. I want you to build an ark. What's an ark? It's a big boat. Okay, I can do that. Why? Because rain is going to come on the earth. What's that? Water is going to fall from the sky. Okay, it's never happened before. And so he begins to build the ark. And it takes him over a hundred years. And he's building on it. In fact, his children were born after God had given the instructions to build the ark. But can you imagine him building this big ark? And God gave him the specific dimensions of it. Again, it's found in the book of Genesis. God had given the specific uh, dimensions of it. 
And he began to go to work on it. Begin to build the ark. Begin to labor away on it. Meanwhile, his neighbors are watching him. Could you imagine if you were building a big ark on your property on a hilltop? And people coming by and say, Noah, what are you doing? Well, I'm building a big ark. Why? Because water is going to come from the sky and going to flood the earth. What? Water doesn't come from the sky. Are you crazy? You mean to tell me you're building this ark because you're afraid water is going to come from the sky? He was a laughing stock, and the Bible speaks about this. He's, he's saying something that ha- they have never experienced before. He's explaining that he is responding to a God that has told him something that sounded impossible. Water coming from the sky. And yet he did it by faith. You know, for us, we see water come from the sky, precipitation. It's supposed to snow later today, yay. We, we can understand that. But could you imagine in a world where water had never come from the sky? And trying to explain it. Hey, guess what? These water droplets are going to fall. And there's so many of them going to fall that God's going to flood the earth. What? Also knowing that the world is two-thirds land and one-third water inverse to what it is today. I mean, this is a big, tall tale to them. It's impossible. But you know that we believe in impossible things too. We believe that one day Jesus Christ, who is God, is going to come back from the glories of heaven. We believe that he is going to rapture us up. Those who us who are alive and remain shall meet them together up in the air. That God is going to call us away and we're going to disappear in a twinkling of an eye. The one one thousandth of a second. That sounds pretty impossible, doesn't it? You mean to tell me that one day Jesus is going to just going to show up. And when he just shows up, all of a sudden these people are going to disappear. You mean to tell me that one day you think you are going to disappear? Sounds pretty impossible, doesn't it? But why do we believe it? Because of God's word. We have confidence in God's word. That's what Noah had. That's the only thing that Noah had. He didn't have barometric instruments to go ahead and tell him what's going to happen. Of course, he was building the ark for 100 years. There's a lot of things that could change with barometric pressure. This was a lifetime commitment. I guarantee that none of you have committed to do a project for a hundred years. <laughs> but Noah, this is a long range p- project. This isn't something that he starts and says, ah, forget it. He's committed to it. And he's working at it by faith in God. Now again, why could he do this? Well, first of all, because he had already known previously that God was a savior. That God's the one who had forgiven him. And he had worked on having a relationship with the Lord. He trusted God and God trusted him. Because of that relationship, he was very willing to believe whatever God told him. But it started with this previous relationship. Why do some people have a hard time listening to what God says? Because their relationship with God isn't close. Does that make sense? You have to have a close relationship. You have to know him first of all as your personal savior. Forgiving of your sins. But also to be able to walk with him. And then you have no problems believing whatever he tells you to do. When someone who's a believer has a hard time obeying God. It's because that relationship with God is not where it should be. There's something off. But here he's able to do something that sounds impossible or or to respond to news that sounds impossible and yet prepare for it even though it had never happened before. We could see by faith. That's why the faith of Noah is such an amazing thing. He's responding to news. He's responding to God's word about something that had never happened before. Which brings me to another thing, not only Noah's faith, but Noah's fear. Noah's fear. Notice with me again in verse number 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with 
fear prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Notice this. Why did Noah have this fear? Because God warned Noah. You asked, but what did God, Noah think about this warning? He believed it. He believed it. If we could hear Noah preaching in that day, you know what he would be saying? Is that because of sin, death is coming. Destruction is coming. And the only way to be saved, to be delivered from this judgment to come, is to believe God's word and trust in his way of escape. That's what he preached. By the way, it calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Meaning that while he's building on the ark, he's also preaching to everyone else. Why am I building this ark? Because judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. He was moved with fear. Now, notice, he was not afraid of the circumstances. He had a fear of God. You know, one of the... uh, Let's see if I can find the exact word. One of the disheartening things is to try to explain to someone that you are going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account for all of your actions. And the actions that you do on this earth will matter for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. There is a judgment of God. What you do in this life does matter. And everything is going to be given to account. Everything. The Bible says every idle word. What does that idle word mean? The idle word means the word that you're, you're saying without thinking about it. For example, unfortunately for myself, I have a jukebox in my head. Of all the junk music that I listen to. And all that it takes is for me to go to a grocery store. Hear something overhead. And next thing you know, you find yourself singing to that song that you heard long time ago and you don't even realize you're singing it but you're singing it yourself that's an idle word and the bible says that every idle word is going to be brought into judgment but not only that do you believe god's word yes then why don't you act like it we are going to be judged by god's word that judgment is real And you understand one of the most disheartening things as a preacher is to be talking about the judgment of God and to look in people's eyes and see that they don't get it, they don't understand it, and they don't care. They don't care. To understand that there's a fear of God, that you're going to stand before a living God and you're going to give an account. We were talking about prayer requests Earlier, that deer season opened up and we were talking about those hunters that are going out. And sure, we want to pray for safety, but many of them are putting the deer as an idol. When you stand before God, how are you going to explain, well, I decided to go chase after my idol, then show up to church? How do you explain that to God? How do you justify that to God? When we encourage people that the greatest thing you could do on a daily basis is to be in the word of God for yourself. That you need to be in God's word. How do you stand before God and say, you know, I just didn't feel like it. How do you justify that? What are you going to tell God? We, all, we know that what we're going to end up saying is nothing because what can you say? There is no justification. But the judgment of God is is real. The Bible describes for all of those that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, there's a thing called the white throne judgment. And there they are going to be judged by their works and they're going to be sentenced to a real place called the lake of fire. And it's an awful place. And yet it doesn't phase. People don't care. To know that they're going to stand before a holy God. For Christians, you will face judgment. And you're not being judged whether you're going to hell or not. But you're going to be judged on what you did for Christ and your motives for doing it. 
For example, you know, there's some people that show up to church not because they want to. I suppose some have to. Well, that's not the right motive. You know, there's some people who look like they don't want to be at church. How do I know? (laughs) Everything but pay attention to God's word. And they're going to stand before God. And God said, I try to tell you in that service, I try to tell you something important. And you were like, and God says, I was trying to tell you. You understand the judgment of God is real. And Noah, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen yet, moved with fear. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. He moved with fear. What was this fear? The fear of the Lord. The fear that he was going to give an account for God for his actions. Knowing that God's judgment was coming upon the world. This was a fear of God doing what he said he was going to do. And again, he's this preacher of righteousness. And he's giving this account. Noah's primary fear was not the coming wrath, but the fear of the Lord. When we fear the Lord as we should, we are not frightened by the circumstances of this world. Because the fear of God fades everything away. Our fear is to be obedient to Him, not the things of this world. And Noah, remember, he was in a world that hated God. And he was literally the only one that was serving God. Think about that. Out of the entire world to be the only one that's obeying God. You know how hard that would be to continue to serve? Continue to do what? To build an ark out in the middle of land and try to tell everyone that water is going to come from the sky? No wonder he made the Hall of Faith chapter. Because he had faith when no one else did. A trust and a fear of the Lord. We start off with Noah's faith. We continued with Noah's fear. But then I want to show you one last thing here. Noah's family. Noah's family. Notice with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Moved with fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By the which he condemned the world. And became heir of righteousness which is by faith. Now, the way that he led his family. Now, remember, we kind of gave this time frame. God gave Noah the command to build the ark. And he built it for a hundred and something years. His sons were born after that commandment. Meaning that he was a believer beforehand, before his children were born. And so when his children are born, he had to raise them in a way that they were willing to, by faith, work with him to build the ark. And they helped him build the ark. He had the privilege of knowing God before he had children. And he raised his family in such a way that they too feared God. That they too wanted to obey the Lord. That they too wanted to observe and knowing that the judgment of God was coming. And the way that he raised his family condemned the world. It was a condemnation. It was a testimony. It was a thing that Noah believed what God said. And it was evidenced by how he raised his kids. May I give a bad example? I remember once speaking with, uh, when I was in the military, speaking with a master sergeant supervisor of mine. We went out to lunch and We were talking about spiritual things. And I asked her, she had a bunch of kids, like seven. And I asked her, I said, well, so tell me about you. Uh, Are you 100% sure if you die today, go to heaven? Yes. And she told me a clear testimony. I said, praise the Lord. Well, do your kids know? Are your kids 100% sure if they die today, go to heaven? No, I decided I was going to let them choose for themselves. I said, do you believe heaven's real? Yes. Yes. Do you believe hell is real? Yes. Do you believe real people go there? Yes. Then why wouldn't you tell your kids? Well, I just figured it's up to them. No! 
I meant they got to make the final decision, but you have to tell them. You have to live in such a way that they say, Mom has a walk with God. She believes that God is real. Therefore, I could follow that. Do you know why so many children of quote-unquote Christians don't follow the Lord? Because their parents don't live like God is real. It's the testimony they have. Words are cheap. Remember what I said about this Hall of Faith chapter. Faith always produces action. Faith always produces action. Well, someone may say, well, wait a second. I did not have the privilege of being a Christian before my kids were born. What do I do? Well, the Bible has an answer for that. Notice with me in the book of 1 Peter chapter number 3. So you're in the book of Hebrews now. The next book is the book of James. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 3. Now in here, it, it gives a scenario of a husband and wife. The wife is saved, but the husband is not. And by the way, those things happen. But we can apply this to any situation. Say that I'm saved, but my kids are not. I didn't have the privilege of following after Christ before I was saved. <laughs> or, or I didn't have the, have the privilege of raising my kids <laughs> before or after I was saved. They were born before I was saved. What do I do now? Well, here, notice this. Hebrew, or the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, notice this. It does not say that wives, what you need to do is you need to learn how to hold your Bible. And what you need to do is you need to learn how to get a good grip on the spine. So that way you got a good... And then you whack him over the head over it until he finally listens. Is, that's not what it says. How does it say that the husband could be one without the word by the conversation of the wife? The word conversation here, it means behavior. By how someone behaves. Verse number two, while they, the husbands, behold your, the wives, chaste conversation coupled with fear. By the way, what fear is that? Not the fear of him, but the fear of God. The same fear that Noah had, that judgment is coming, that God is going to keep his word. Who's adorning, not let it be the outward adorning of plating of hair and wearing of gold or putting on a raiment. Meaning that we're not putting the emphasis on the outside. Let me tell you, husband, I'm going to dress and look like a Christian, and you will see it. Uh, look at me. That's not what it's talking about. It's trying to put emphasis. It's not on the outside, but instead, notice verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Notice this. It says that what you need to do is promote the inner man. The inner man is not promoted by saying, look at how spiritual I am. If you have to tell someone how spiritual you are, you're not. If you have to tell someone what a great Christian you are, you are not. It's going to be evidenced. And so here it's talking about in the scenario, how do I reach my family? I don't reach my family by beating them over the head with a Bible. I don't reach my family by saying, look at how I dress. Look at me. I'm spiritual. But instead, it is becoming the best Christian you ought to be. Now, what's going to happen is that, first of all, the husband in this scenario is going to scratch his head and say, what in the world's wrong with this crazy lady? What's wrong with her? Then he's going to say, well, it won't last. And he's going to try to wait it out. She's just going through a phase. She'll get over it. She just got some religion now, but you know, it won't last. But when it does last, now, like I said, this isn't overnight. This is going to be a period of time where the people are watching this Christian decide, I'm going to behave like a Christian. I'm going to live like a Christian. Have you ever been caught praying? 
Meaning that you were in your prayer closet. Not show, you're not in the middle of the living room where they trip over you. But you were in your prayer closet. You were in your, in your room. You were wherever you study your Bible. And they go in and say, hey, I need, oh, I didn't realize you, you pray? Wait, I, I caught you reading your, you read your Bible? They're not doing it for show. They catch you when you're reading it and spending time with God on your own. They're watching you as your language changes. Your countenance changes. And you start living like God is real. And what they're going to say eventually, I may not understand all that she believes, but I do want to know one thing. She believes her God is real. She believes that the Bible is true. I may not believe it, but she does. What a great testimony that is for someone to say, I believe they believe the Bible is true. That is what it is. It's the conversation. And by the way, Noah had to raise his kids in this manner that they said, you know what? We've never seen rain fall. And we hear all the kids at school laughing at dad saying about how crazy dad is. And then later on, they're helping out with the boat. Why? Why didn't they just leave the house and say, I can't deal with this crazy person anymore? Because they said, dad believes this is true. And by the way, he carries his life. We believe it's true because he does. You understand? It's this conversation. It's the way that he was consistent. You know, we all seen the hypocrites. Perhaps you've all been the hypocrite. Show up. Let's do this scenario. Okay, we can relate to this. You wake up in the morning on Sunday morning. You hit the snooze button probably seven times too many. And then you say, all right, get up, get up. Come on, kids, we got to get up. We got to go. Come on, we got to, I'm running late. Oh, no, where's your shoes? Why can't you find your shoes? No, you can't wear that. That's dirty. Come on. Come Come on, you didn't eat breakfast? Why didn't you tell me that earlier? And you get into this big thing, and and you're still fussing as you drive to church, and I can't do it. Why can't you do it? Why you can't wait till we get home? And then you step outside on the parking lot, And your halos go up and your shine goes. The Bible's tucked in. Hi, we love Jesus. I'm glad to see you. We can all put on a good face as a show. But it's the consistency that matters. We can reach our loved ones if we live like the Bible is real. We can reach our loved ones, even if they didn't live with us when we were saved. We can still reach our loved ones if we believe like the Bible is true. Live like the Bible is true. And they watch us. Now, it takes time because they've known all of us all of our life. And they've seen our flaws and our mistakes and our whatever else. They have to see the changes. The greatest evidence that the Bible works, the greatest evidence that we, what we say about biblical Christianity is true, is the evidence of a changed life. That things are different. It's one of the greatest evidences. But let me tell you, that evidence tells the world, I believe this is true. When Noah started building the ark, it took him over 100 years. When he was building that ark, don't you think everyone else say, ah, he'll get over it. He started this project, but it's not going to finish. But as he continued to do it, and then he raised his kids, and his kids willingly helped. It was a condemnation, a conviction to the world. They believe this is true. They believe that water is going to come from the sky. They believe that God is sending judgment. It probably caused some to pause and to think. Now, by the way, other than Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Other than them, did anyone else get on the boat? No. Now, was Noah held responsible for that? No. He did what he was supposed to. The results are not up to us. They're up to God. God does it. But he uses us as instruments. Noah was found as a preacher of righteousness and the Bible 
complements what he did, not condemns him. Meaning that, well, Noah's a failure because he didn't see anybody else saved. No, 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 no. He was excess because he lived obedient to the Lord. The results are up to God. People make their own decisions. We're just the messenger boy. That's all Noah was. He was the messenger. God's going to bring destruction down. God's bringing destruction down. He's letting them know, I believe it. God's going to bring destruction. He's being the witness. He's being the testimony. But he believed it. And he behaved like he believed it. It wasn't for show. It was a commitment. And God said because of this, he's a preacher of righteousness. Notice again verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. Hebrews chapter number 11 verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Notice that phrase, he became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Noah loved his family and he knew that they needed to be on the ark. Likewise, we need to tell loved ones that God is real and that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. We need to tell him that he rose from the dead and that the only place of safety is in him. There is no other way. And that message is going to be backed up by our consistency. Do we believe God is real? By faith. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.